Welcome and thank you for joining us for this Flinders University Brave event, Mind Games, where we will discuss mental health, well-being and resilience. I'm Karen Ashford and I'm delighted to host tonight's event, aligned to both Mental Health Week and International Open Access Week. To begin with, I'd like to acknowledge that we're hosting this forum on the traditional lands of the Ghana people and that we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We also acknowledge and convey our deep appreciation to those elders of all nations upon whom we operate. This evening's event is delivered as part of our BRAVE lecture series. Why BRAVE? Because through this series we showcase our researchers who challenge the status quo and bravely investigate with a view to resolve some of the big societal challenges of our time. This series is supported by Bank SA, who we are delighted to welcome as our presenting partner. Tonight, we're fortunate to bring together two mental health experts, Professor Mike Kyrgios and Jörp van Agteren. They're joined by Liz Hall, Flinders University's Associate Librarian, who will discuss the importance of access to accurate, evidence-based and trusted information in a time of much misinformation. A reminder that if you can't stay for the full duration of the live stream, you can watch our recording later via our website, flinders.edu.au. As always, we're keen to make this an interactive event with a live Q&A session. It's your chance to participate in the discussion and to pose questions to the speakers in real time. We do ask, however, that everyone treats this forum as a place of respectful engagement, where people are treated with dignity and where differing views are tolerated. We're ready to start receiving your questions now via the message function on this platform, or you can join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag BraveResearch. It's now my pleasure to invite our expert librarian, Liz Hall, to tell us about Open Access Week and its importance globally. Over to you, Liz. Thank you, Karen. And thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight during what is International Open Access Week. We in the library are wholehearted supporters of open access. Indeed, our director is a passionate advocate. Unfortunately, he was unable to join us tonight due to a prior commitment. I'd just like to start with some background about what open access is. Open access is about ensuring that research can be read and used by anyone who needs it, any time they need it, and anywhere they happen to be with an internet connection. It is about having access to quality, trusted information backed by evidence-based research in order to solve many of our modern day challenges, whether they be in climate change, global pandemics, or mental health. It is a way of providing equity to the research literature, which has traditionally been bound up and sold by our publishers. Put simply, open access provides a seamless gateway to evidence-based research. Further, it means that research is findable as well as accessible, interoperable and reusable by anyone, anywhere. And those keywords, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable, form the acronym FAIR, which supports the principles of open access. International Open Access Week promotes these principles as well as the benefits of open access and this year's theme is Open with Purpose. It challenges us to think about how to build structural equity and inclusion in the systems that support open access, consistent with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, especially Goal 4, which addresses inclusive and equitable quality education and lifelong learning opportunities for all. Being open with purpose means that research can be accessed when it is needed, wherever it is needed, whether this is by other researchers to build on the knowledge or by practitioners in health or education who can use it to improve client and patient outcomes, as well as by any members of the public who may be looking for crucial information for themselves. Libraries have always had an ethical responsibility with regard to access to information. Indeed, it is an underlying principle of the profession that freedom of access to information, ideas and creative works is a human right. Our International Federation of Libraries Associations Code of Ethics supports the principles of open access to research as an effective and efficient means of providing information to users. Here at Flinders Library, we're guided by these principles supporting open access in a number of ways. And I'd just like to share a few examples tonight. 
So firstly, we're providing and maintaining an open access repository to Flinders Research as a trusted source of information. This is made available online via a searchable portal, that, portal sorry, that is free for anyone to use. Over 4,000 research papers and outputs are available from this portal and can be accessed by anyone internationally. We're also providing open access to the Flinders th thesis collection of both PhD and master's research theses. These are important sources of new and emerging areas of research, and there are close to 2,000 of these available, again, for anyone to freely access. We're also supporting open access education resources by actively seeking these out and working with academic partners to incorporate them into the curriculum for our students to use. And finally, we're supporting new models of publishing by signing transformative agreements with our publishing partners to create efficiencies and value for researchers and readers alike. The events of this year have for me demonstrated that open research is crucial, not just here at Flinders or in Australia, but around the world. Our problems are global and our solutions need to be too. Open access to research ensures that anyone who needs access to research can access it. And what better opportunity than now at tonight's brave lecture about, at which we will also hear about important research discoveries in mental health to share this open access message. Thank you for the opportunity to do so. Thanks, Liz. Um, and what a timely um, reminder of the importance of knowledge um, and the wealth of information that uh, should and is freely available, um, including the exceptional research that's undertaken here at Flinders. Um, and speaking of exceptional, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Mike Kyrgios. Mike's joining us in lockdown from Melbourne this evening, where he's living through the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the same sort of challenges presented to many around the world. Now, Mike usually does reside here in Adelaide, where he's our Vice President and Executive Dean of the College of Education, Psychology and Social Work. Uh, he's also uh, the Director of the Orima Institute for Mental Health and Wellbeing here at Flinders University. An academic and clinical psychologist with expertise in mental health, well-being and psychological treatments, including those that are delivered digitally, Mike is a world-leading expert in obsessive-compulsive disorder, hoarding disorder, body dysmorphic disorder, trichotillomania, shopping-buying disorder and anxiety disorders. He also has an interest in chronic medical conditions, their mental health comorbidities and self-management. He covers a lot of ground. Tonight, Mike will be discussing the difference between mental health and mental illness and where well-being fits in, the impact of COVID-19 on the mental health and well-being of individuals and communities, and he'll also talk through the prevention and management strategies and tools available to those who may need them. Mike, over to you. Thanks, Karen, and uh, greetings from Middle Park in, in, in Melbourne. Uh, as you say, I've been in lockdown for a while, but I'm uh, really happy that restrictions are lifting and that the South Australian border has actually opened up. So I'll be home soon. Um, firstly, I want to acknowledge that um, I'm on the land of the Yalukit Willem people uh, of the Kulin Nations. Um, and I pay my respects to, to their elders, past, present and emerging. Um, I'm, I feel very privileged uh, to be able to join you from here. Um, where the lands and the traditions of, of its peoples um, have been looked after for tens of thousands of years. Um, thanks everyone for joining us today, uh, where we're going to discuss, I think, some issues that are really crucial uh, to our communities, particularly at this time. Um, firstly, what I'm going to do is acknowledge uh, that um, many of the uh, slides that you'll see today, I have presented with uh, one of our panel members, uh, Yup. Um, uh, from the Assembly Wellbeing and Resilience Centre. Um, and I'll firstly outline what it is that I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background uh, about um, you know, mental illness, wellbeing, mental disorder, mental health, you know, what are the differences? Um, um, and and I'll, I'll introduce this as, as kind of background. I'll then go on to talk a little bit about the research that we've been undertaking at Flinders, um, together with the, um, the, the, the gang from, from SAMRI. Um, and then I'm going to spend a little bit of time towards the end talking a little bit about the implications of the work that we've done for policy um, and for service provision um, moving forward. 
And then at the end, I guess uh, we'll, we'll have a, a, a bit, big old discussion with Q&A. Um, so let's look at some definitions first. So mental illness, uh, well, uh, mental illnesses are conditions that involve changes in emotion, in thinking and in behavior. Um, and, and, and I think most of us have actually had this experience over the past few weeks um, um, with, with well, certainly since the, the, the COVID pandemic hit us. Um, we have felt those changes in emotion. We, we have felt fear. We have felt uncertainty. We've changed our behaviors. We are much more avoidant of certain situations. We've changed our thinking um, and, and our tolerance for uncertainty and our tolerance for um, you know, um, frustration. Um, so we've all had a bit of a taste of it. And so it, it becomes very difficult. It, it's kind of vague to find out where the demarcation is between mental illness and not mental illness. And that's actually one of the, one of the issues in, um, in, in, in this particular area. And I'll come, I'll, I'll come back to this issue um, in, in, in a little while. Um, sorry, uh, there we go. Uh, I'm not going to harp on uh, too much about some of the statistics, uh, the mental health statistics um, for, for, you know, that, that we all know, uh, but I will focus on, on a few of them. So one in two people will experience a mental illness sometime in their life. Um, Post-COVID, of course, that may be quite different. And I've already uh, indicated that we've all, you know, had this sort of universal experience of certainly symptoms of, 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 of mental disorders or, or mental health challenges. Um, over half of people with a mental illness actually don't access treatment. And of those, and, and, and again, only half are as likely as those with physical illnesses uh, to, to, to access treatment. There's a whole range of reasons uh, for this, from stigma, uh, to poor mental health literacy, people just don't know. Uh, there are issues around access. And of course, there are other issues around help seeking and uh, who some people are more likely to seek help other th than others. There are other issues around access to do with, say, uh, where you live, um, your, your social economic status, um, uh, your, your cultural background. Um, and, and these remain huge challenges to the mental health system. Um, uh, in, in Australia, despite the fact that, you know, we, we have um, good services uh, relative, relative to other countries. Now, we hear that mental health um, challenges through the community have become more prominent during the COVID period. So let's just look and see if that's actually true. If you look through the newspapers, you'll find that calls to Beyond Blue were reported to have increased by almost 50% in June. Mental health services funded by Medicare certainly did increase by nearly 10% in August. Um, the AMA has reported that general practitioners are now seeing a 30% increase in patients presenting with a mental health problem. Victorian figures in, in August showed uh, about a third increase in people under 18 uh, being treated in emergency uh, departments for intentional self-harm. And the overall rate uh, of increase was, was around 9%. In South Australia, the chief psychiatrist reported about a 10% increase in August compared to 2019 uh, in mental health um, and drug and alcohol emergency department presentations across Adelaide hospitals. Um, and half of the increase was actually in people who were uh, less than 25 years of age. However, a recent report from the Victorian coroner found that there were no changes in suicide rates in 2020 over the same periods uh, from 2016 to 2019. So here are the rates. And you can see that there's somewhere around 420 to 470 uh, across all of those years. Um, although, you know, Coroner John Cain did, did, did comment that it was encouraging to see that there hasn't been an increase um, in suicide rates to date, and certainly not over the COVID period, uh, but clearly we all need to focus on preventing any more suicides um, and, and to see so, uh, those figures go down. And look, and it may be that in fact, we haven't really seen um, the kind of the build up to, to the increases in suicides, but certainly amongst um, uh, youth mental health services, certainly amongst some of the adult mental health services, there is this ever present fear that suicide rates are going to go up at some point. So what do we make of all this? Well. 
Clearly, there are, there's anecdotal evidence of, of longer waiting lists uh, backed up by Medicare usage and helpline uh, figures. Um, the question for me, though, is, of course, what's offered to people while, the, while they're on waiting lists? And at present, there's virtually nothing offered to them. And I'm going to come back to this point because I think this is an important issue. Um, we know that there are increased needs, but not yet reflected in the higher suicide rates. But it does appear that younger people uh, may be more prone, may be more at risk and are feeling it a little bit more um, intensely. And that's why some of the self-harm figures are beginning to come through. Um, clearly, we need to understand what mitigating factors might be at play here. So is it that, you know, people who are closer to their family are kind of protected? Is it that um, areas that have got more services? And clearly there are more services because government has been throwing money um, uh, at mental health um, ever since COVID, you know, uh, a, f a few weeks after the COVID uh, pandemic hit. And that's the right thing to do. But again, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later on. I think we need to nuance a little bit more what it is that we're actually doing. Um, and clearly one of the things that we do need to nuance is to emphasise the importance of prevention and early intervention because these services are not available. They're not readily available and they're not available in, in ways that are accessible to people easily. Um, I'll talk about some of the research that we've done in actually um, developing uh, prevention and early intervention programs. And, and ultimately, what should we be thinking about? Uh, you know, how should we be thinking and what, what's the kind of framework that we should be using in trying to develop our ideas for early inter intervention and prevention programs? Now, let me go back to um, the distinction between mental health and mental illness. Most people think that they're opposite ends of the same spectrum, that there's a dimension and you have mental illness at one end and you have mental health and well-being at the other end. Um, and there are people who are somewhere in the middle. Now, you know, that's kind of useful, I guess, but it's actually not accurate. The two dimensions, mental health and well-being and mental illness are actually quite separate dimensions. And the reality is, that we can then plot people on these two dimensions. And I'm, I'm gonna show you a graph now that, that, that's a little bit complicated, but I'll, I'll take you through it. So here are the two dimensions. On the one hand, you've got high levels of well-being and low levels, uh, levels of well-being. And uh, across the horizontal uh, plane, you see low mental illness symptoms and high mental um, uh, illness symptoms. Um, you can actually have high mental illness symptoms, but still be feeling okay about the world, still be feeling okay about yourself and about your future. You can still have a high level of well-being. Now, this only accounts for about 2% of people, um, but they're an important group for us to understand because they will help us to understand how people can recover um, to some degree from, from mental illnesses. But of course, the research that we've been doing um, really has been focusing on um, people who've got low well-being, some of whom have got symptoms, some of whom have very low mental uh, illness symptoms, um, but they're still vulnerable. They're still vulnerable for developing um, uh, mental illness symptoms. And so this group is vulnerable and it accounts for about 28% of people. And again, there are no real existing services for that particular group of people. And we think that group of people is actually trying to um, access services and clogging up the system. Um, uh, and, and, and there may be things that we can do to help uh, prevent that clogging up of the system um, and, and, the, and the ever increasing um, um, wait lists for, for mental health services. Of course, this is where we want people to get to. We want people to have complete mental health. We want them to have low symptoms, but also a high sense of well-being. Um, and, and again, there, there's lots that can be done to help people get to that point. And that's some of the research that we've been doing that, that I'll talk about soon. Now, there are multiple theories of, of well-being and, and multiple um, uh, reasons why we need to be focusing on well-being. Um, in the past, there's been a kind of an interest in, in, in the mental health services of looking at people's deficits. What's wrong with people? And fixing up what's wrong with people. 
Now, that to me sounds like a little bit of a, of sort of a, a glass half empty approach, rather than looking at what strengths people have and how we can use people's strengths to help them develop a, a better sense of well-being, a better sense of themselves, and to develop skills that will help them deal with some of the challenges. Um, again, uh, the, the mental health system either sees you as having a, a problem or not having a problem. And there's very little that's done for people kind of in the middle. Um, there's very little focus on recovery. Uh, the only thing that you know, mental health services up until now, or mental disorder services, because that's essentially what they are. The thing that they've been really focused on is symptom relief. Um, less so interested in the determinants of mental health, um, less so interested in improving quality of life. Although these things might happen for the most part, they don't always happen. And as soon as your symptoms start to kind of get a little bit better, you're out of the system and somebody else comes in. Um, now, the construct of well-being, which is taking a more, more of a positive approach to people, a more strengths-based approach to people, is kind of complicated. And there are numerous, numerous concepts and theories. Now, I'm going to take you through these um, very briefly. Don't be afraid. It, I'll, you know, it, it, the next slide is, I'm just warning you. Um, so there are these three major theories, and there are others, of course, and they, they share about 80% of, 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 there's kind of a commonality between them all. Um, the hedonic theory of, of well-being really focuses on uh, life satisfaction, how satisfied are you with your life, and the balance between positive and negative emotions. Perma theory, which was really promoted by Martin Seligman, who was a thinker in residence here in, um, in, in, in Adelaide for a number of years, he brings an integrated theory of well-being, uh, again, interested in positive emotions, but also interested in relationships, uh, engagement, um, and also meaning and purpose in life and one's level of achievement or, or how one senses that one can achieve in life. And then we have the eudaimonic theory of well-being, which is really one of the theories that is quite well, um, uh, uh, you, know, uh, um, you know, people have really taken it on very, very seriously now um, because it looks at a whole range of issues like self-acceptance and even self-compassion, really, uh, personal growth, mastery over one's environment, and of course, this issue of autonomy and, and um, self-agency. And we think that this is a really important part of, of people taking control of their lives and people taking control of, of their own mental health. Um, now, lots of reasons why, why you know, well-being is important um, in, in, in um, our personal lives, in our community, and in fact, even in industry. So, Lower hospital utilization by people with high levels of well being, faster recovery from surgery and illness, um, improved management of their chronic illnesses, um, improved quality of life, improved productivity for, for businesses, decreased absenteeism. So, if people have a high sense of well being, irrespective of what's going on in the workplace, people who are resilient and, and have a good sense of well being are less likely to stay away from work they're more likely to be productive. And interestingly, decreased personal insurance claims. Now, there's evidence to support all of this. Um, and this is a reason why we really all need to start focusing on well-being as well as um, you know, mental illness or symptoms of mental illness. So I'm now gonna take you through some of the research that we've been doing. Um, and um, you know, we've got multiple projects going on in conjunction between SAMRI and, and us at, um, at the Orima Institute. Um, but I'm only gonna talk about a few of them today. Um, there's just so much going on. Um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna talk about our student wellbeing project, uh, particularly around university student uh, wellbeing. I'm gonna talk a little bit about our um, community projects um, and some interesting data that we've collected before COVID and since COVID. And then some of the programs uh, of intervention that we've, we've sort of been developing and uh, in particular, the one that we're rolling out now, which is, um, we think, um, really one of, the, one of the potential solutions to some of the problems that, that we see in our mental health services at the moment, and that's the Be Well Plan. Um, now, we measure key aspects of mental uh, well-being, mental health, and mental disorder uh, in, our, in the platform that, 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 that we have. Um, 
And this is important because you need to measure both. You need to know what the deficits are, but you also need to know what the strengths are. You need to facilitate positive change in people and to use the strengths to actually help people manage the, the challenges that they actually face. And so the, the assessment framework that we use is, is, is um, inclusive of all of these factors. And our data, um, uh, as we'll go through it soon, um, uh, you know, reflects how, how important getting this broad spectrum of, data, of, of information is. Um, so, probably about 18 months ago, um, Yup and I got together and um, uh, started talking about how we might measure uh, well-being in university students. Um, there was a lot of literature suggesting that university students were not doing as well as their counterparts in the community. And, and this, is, this is really, um, in, in many ways, it's kind of tragic, really, that the, the leaders of tomorrow, the, the, the professional workforce of tomorrow, is not doing as well in their mental health and in their resilience as the rest of the population. I mean, how is that so? Um, and what can we do about it? They come to university, we give them skills, we give them knowledge, but actually should we also be um, facilitating the, the, the onboarding of information around mental, uh, mental health and wellbeing more generally? Um, so we've been conducting a number of waves of um, data collection, um, firstly in our College of Education, Psychology and Social Work, and now more broadly across the university, uh, uh, across um, four colleges now. Um, and, and what we're finding is really some um, consistent messaging. So we found that only one in five university students showed low levels of distress and high levels of well-being, what we call good mental health. One in five. That is just a terrible figure. Um, we know that in the community, it was actually two in five. So this is half. Um, now, we completed a number of uh, measurements, including well-being, depression, anxiety. Um, the dark green line um, um, is the general population, and the um, light green line uh, are university students. And you can see that the university students do badly um, across um, all, all measures. Um, what's interesting, um, with, certainly within the, the, the student population, is that females, domestic students, metropolitan students and younger students are consistently worse off. And this reflects some of the um, differences that we see in the community, although it's a little bit more complicated in the community because we need to, to look at a whole range of factors. Um, th there's this kind of sense that rural communities are homogeneous. And in fact, they are not because some have uh, better access to, um, uh, to, to services. Some uh, have closer proximity to, to other people. Uh, some have been through bushfires, some have been through droughts, some have been through other kinds of challenges. So we're now looking at the rural communities uh, with a particular uh, focus of, uh, to try and just, um, you know, nut out some of, some of the issues for, for those communities. And um, um, if anyone's interested in joining us in, 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 that, uh, in that research, please let us know. Um, now, we've also been looking at um, community um, wellbeing and mental health and, and mental distress. Um, both pre and, and, and post or peri-COVID. Um, and we've got some data now um, that, that can really help us to understand uh, what's been going on. Um, what we do know is that during COVID, distress due to depression, anxiety, and stress, uh, as well as mental well-being, life satisfaction, resilience, were significantly down relative to um, pre-COVID periods. And in fact, only 21%, again, this one in five number um, of respondents during COVID displayed good mental health compared to 42% uh, pre-COVID. When we look down at some of the, look at some of the details, again, you can see that um, there was significant downswing during the initial lockdown, you know, when, when the COVID pandemic first started, round about March, April. And you can see that downswing in, in well-being the upswing in depression and the upswing in, in um, anxiety. Things then started to get better. Um, and then post the Victorian um, period, what you're finding is that we're, 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 that we've got this downswing again. 
So well-being is on the way down, depression is on the way up, and anxiety is on the way up. Um, so this is a little bit concerning. Um, now, last week, and this is data that's really hot off the press, and we just wanted to show it to you today. Um, we did a, a national survey of mental health uh, and well-being because it was Mental Health Week, and we thought that we do a, a national survey. Um, and we were able to compare data from the Mental Health Week um, survey, from the COVID Wave 1 survey, and from the 2019 norms. And again, what you'll find is that in terms of well-being, it was significantly down compared to the 2019 norms in both Mental Health Week and the, the, the first wave of COVID. With respect to depression and anxiety, we see some differences. Um, during the COVID period, depression was up, but not during the Mental Health Week. Um, anxiety, however, continues to rise and to stay up. Um, and I think the longer we're in this um, uh, pandemic, the longer that there are uncertainties, the longer we have to be in lockdown or, or, or be in quarantine or, or not know what the future holds um, and have financial uncertainties, um, have job uncertainties. Um, you know, we know the economy's down, having housing uncertainties. All of these things are, um, are impacting on people's anxiety. And this, um, uncertainty, the fears, um, I, I suspect that this is going to be maintained. And what we need is a different approach. What we need to do is work out ways that we can help the community more broadly and specific elements of the community where uh, they might be feeling a, a little bit more than others to help maintain their well-being, to help them become resilient to these changes um, and to help them um, I guess, manage their distress and their fears um, uh, as, as best as possible. And there are ways of doing this. If you go onto the Orima website, we have a whole range of acronyms, um, as we call them, you know, letters that um, have a particular meaning, um, uh, you know, that, that will give people some, some hints as to how to manage um, uh, various challenges uh, uh, of, of, of the COVID pandemic. But of course, we've also put a lot of these elements into our treatment, um, which is uh, called the Be Well Plan. And so I'm now going to turn my attention um, to, um, to the, you know, the Be Well Plan and the, the wellbeing interventions that we've developed. But again, we have to remember that the 2019 outcomes were better than those in both the first wave of COVID and during Mental Health Week. And this is going to be, uh, I think, an ongoing issue. Uh, uh, if we look to Europe, we know that the pen, you know, the, the, there are new waves. Um, outcomes, are, um, psychological outcomes, are, are, are very similar. Deaths are not as uh, as prevalent or as as, um, as they were. I think we're um, able to to manage um, some of the the the, the challenges of COVID, um, but but not the mental health challenges. And 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 we hope that some of the research that we're doing is uh, able to inform how best to do that. Now, we know that there are generic um, psychological skills that are effective in um, uh, reducing distress and in facilitating and building, um, you know, um, uh, well-being. The effect size in non-clinical populations uh, are typically small, but in clinical populations are actually uh, somewhat larger. Um, the well-being interventions are usually derived from positive psychology whereas the mental disorder or distress interventions come from theories of pathology or kind of taking a deficits um, approach, as I've already mentioned. But the impact of different intervention types on well-being versus disorder um, versus symptoms um, has never really been captured systematically. And so there's been a kind of a substantial gap in the evidence base. So as a group, what we decided to do is actually to undertake a huge uh, systematic review. And, you know, we had 419 different studies. So we trawled all the studies in the world um, that were, you know, of good quality. And we ended up with 419 studies that had been done that had a well-being and a mental health um, or mental illness, mental disorder symptoms, um, uh, outcomes. Um, and this 
amassed to about, you know, just over 53,000 participants. So on the basis of all that, we then uh, analysed which were the most effective symptoms. Now, again, I know that this is complicated, uh, this, this particular graph, but I'll take you through it. So the red line and anything on the right side of the red line shows that um, the interventions, whether it's ACT interventions, compassion interventions, cognitive therapy or cognitive behavioural therapy interventions and so forth, anything that's on the right-hand side indicates that there were positive effects. Now, the larger circles indicate larger sample sizes, and then the, they're sort of color-coded, um, the effect sizes. Um, so green is better than uh, yellow, which is greater than orange, which is greater than red. Um, but what you can see from that, and that's the data, but I'm gonna describe it now. Depending on a, a, on a, a, num a range of factors, we identified numerous interventions that can significantly improve both mental health and well-being, or, or mental illness, if you like, mental illness disorder and well-being. And we included these in the Be Well Plan, as I've already said. Um, and it includes things like mindfulness therapy, cognitive and behaviour therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, even yoga, even writing about your experiences, and certainly exercise. All of these things help, and there are a whole range of others. And so what we did then was we designed a well-being program inclusive only of those interventions, those strategies that actually work. Um, we went through a rigorous uh, design process. I won't take you through that, um, but there was a lot of co-design here. We actually got a lot of participants to help us co-design it. We also had learnings from about 5,000 people for whom um, elements of this had been um, uh, disseminated or given um, face to face. But then you see COVID hit and whilst we'd done some um, some of the Be World plan face to face, COVID hit and what we did was we put it all online. And so we now have a Be Well plan that is facilitated by trained uh, facilitators uh, who roll it out on Zoom um, in, a, in a group setting so people can kind of connect with each other um, and we can actually train or, or, or train people in wellbeing interventions um, you know, in, in large groups. Um, uh, and, and we've been doing that um, in the university sector we've been doing that in the community sector as well. And we thought we'd just show you um, some of the data. Um, before I go on there, five sessions. So there are five sessions um, of, of the Be Well plan. Um, and there are two versions. You can do it as a self-guided treatment, um, but we find that the facilitated version is definitely the best, to go, uh, the best way to go because the effect sizes are so much larger. Um, there's, a, 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 there's an assessment um, um, aspect to it and that we use the Be Well Tracker to assess that and then in session one participants learn about their mental health and they ex start to experiment with mindfulness training in particular. In session two we learn about self-compassion and we use uh, people's individual measurements uh, to help them tailor something that is specific to their needs and to their preferences. We don't impose, we, in, we invite people and we inform people and they take self-agency um, in actually um, uh, choosing which uh, interventions are, are going to be best for them. Um, they then explore their own existing resources, they identify their values and match uh, their new activities uh, to these internal resources and to their external resources. And then by session four, uh, they've identified effective ways of dealing with their stress and they start to build a specific plan for when times get tough. And so by session five, uh, they've tracked their progress and they've really developed and, and built a final Be Well plan that they can take with them throughout their life. And as their life evolves, as they evolve as people, they can go back to their toolbox because not forgetting, we have a myriad of interventions that they can, uh, that they can use within that toolbox. Um, not just the ones that they practice, um, uh, during the Be Well plan, but other ones that they have seen and that they can actually uh, use, um, you know, sometime in the future. Here are the results. And what we found that, um, uh, what we found was that um, uh, positive mental health outcomes improved. So resilience, 
life satisfaction, well-being, and psychological distress decreased. Um, what's particularly interesting about the results was that in fact, effect sizes were greater for those people who had a pre-existing mental health problem or mental health challenge prior to COVID. So that's fantastic because this shows that not only can um, the program work as prevention, um, as early intervention, but it can actually work as treatment for people in that mild to moderate um, uh, uh, end of the spectrum. And 76% of people demonstrated some kind of meaningful improvement in five easy sessions. We have multiple testimonials from participants, but I'm going to play you a, 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 a very short video, which is, I just love it because uh, it really sh it goes to show um, that there are no age uh, boundaries in, in, in any of this. So let's just hope that this works. I've had many uh, comments that uh, you're sounding like you're 20 years younger. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and uh, my wife is saying I've rediscovered my husband again uh, and uh, generally people are saying do you sound well so I have no doubt I'm probably going to cry. Okay now let me try and get out of this um, whoops I'll get back to it um Apologies for the technical difficulties, but I'll get there eventually. Um, and there we go. I think we're back again. Okay, so I know that I'm fast running out of time or run out of time, but I did just want to um, let people know that we've actually adapted and the rollout of Be Well Plan for various cohorts. We currently um, under, uh, started a, a project looking at healthcare workers. We've just uh, uh, attracted some funding to, to look at um, um, Indigenous health workers. Um, and there are other groups that, 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 that we'll be looking at um, in, in due course. Um, so let's go to policy now, because I just want to very quickly go through this. Um, and I'm going to use what I call the, the meat pie analogy. So Be Well Plan is something that can be used um, at every, every stage of the game in people's individual evolution or every aspect of the mental health um, services that we do provide. It can be used as tracking, it can be used as prevention, as early intervention, and as intervention for uh, multi-moderate presentations. For more severe to very severe cases, we might be able to use Be Well Plan as, as an addendum but actually, more importantly, we could use it as a waitlist strategy because, as we know, waitlists have increased dramatically over the COVID period. And of course, we can use it as an additional intervention to facilitate recovery. Um, we certainly have evidence that Be Well Plan can be used from things from for all sorts of things, from tracking all the way through to um, treatment um, for for multi moderate presentations. Um, but there are some issues with our um, I guess with our mental health um, uh, um, system. So governments to date have been throwing more money at services, right? And, and this, is, this was a necessary thing, absolutely necessary to do. But I, I'm suggesting that it's now time to evolve and nuance what it is that we do. Um, there's a whole lot of people trying to see psychologists and psychiatrists. And unfortunately, this has led to increased waiting times to see a psychologist or, or a psychiatrist because of our limited workforce. Universities cannot train people fast enough to get out there and to, to become psychologists or psychiatrists. Um, and, and they're very expensive to use. Um, so if Be Well Plan or interventions like Be Well Plan can be used to facilitate prevention or early intervention, or even treatment for mild to moderate cases, then why aren't we using the Be Well Plan for those purposes? Um, and, and that's really the alternative. So there are varying levels of need in the community, as, as we've already um, uh, indicated. And these prevention and early intervention programs could be used 
by not just psychologists and psychiatrists, but actually by peers or by trained facilitators. So the, the facilitators that we use are actually not all psychologists. They're trained, but they're not necessarily psychologists. Um, we could use peers. We could use people with a lived experience to facilitate well-being, particularly if, the, if, if those facilitators um, do have positive well-being. Um, and so we could help a whole range of people build resilience and avoid the need for services. That feeds back to the, the varying uh, levels of need. And we can then avoid the buildup in the pipeline to see the psychologists and the psychiatrists who could then spend more time focusing their attention on people who are very severe or severe or have complex needs. Now, our services, prevention services and early intervention services are very poorly supported. Um, they're, 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 whilst there are some services, there, there's low intensity cognitive behavior therapy, there are online services, but their focus is always on deficits. It's not on the, the kind of using a more positive framework. And I think that this has been missing and this is what really needs to happen moving forward. Um, so let me just summarize um, where we're at. We know that there are challenges to mental health, they're common and they've increased during the, the, the COVID pandemic. We can make a distinction between mental illness and mental health, um, which can be defined as high levels of well-being and resilience and low levels of distress about symptoms um, related to mental illness. We know that there are theories of well-being that focus on a range of factors. Um, and you know, I've outlined them um, uh, during the talk and, and they're there on the, on the slide as well. Um, we know that psychological interventions and strategies can improve well-being and resilience and can help avoid the development of disorder. We know that uh, or we've discussed the introduction of well-being intervention in, into our mental health uh, system, um, being able to facilitate prevention, early intervention, treatment and recovery. And um, they can also be used for um, people who are on wait lists. We know that workforce support for well-being programs uh, does not need to be as intensive as that for active treatment. And therefore, these kinds of well-being programs can help decrease the burden um, on our mental health system. And finally, at the very least, monitoring of well-being can be used to help us gain a, an understanding of what's going on in the community during times of distress, bushfires, floods, drought. Um, and, and, and of course, all of that information can help us plan. So if anyone's interested, um, we are constantly measuring well-being, um, resilience, uh, mental illness symptoms, um, uh, mental health, um, using our Be Well Tracker, um, www.bewelltracker.com. Um, but if you want to uh, access the treatment, then it's www.bewellplan.com. So I'll finish up on that. And if anyone's interested uh, um, in participating in our, in our studies or becoming involved um, and supporting the Orima Institute, please feel free to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for taking us on a pretty epic journey, actually, through mental health and wellbeing and resilience. Um, we're starting to receive some questions from the audience. Uh, this is your chance to put your questions to our panel of experts, so please don't hesitate. We'll do our best to get to all of them tonight in the time that we have, and we may run just a couple of minutes over time if we need to. To get the discussion started, I'd like to formally introduce Yup Van Agteren, who is joining our panel this evening from the Samri Institute. Um, you're also the uh, lead uh, for wellbeing and resilience research at Orima, our institute here at Flinders University. So welcome, thank you, Yup. And we also have Liz joining us tonight. Um, I would like to start the conversation with a question to you both, in fact, and that is this notion of access to data and evidence and how that's an, a crucial part of informed decision making. So I'd like you to both reflect on that in terms of policy making in particular and Liz in terms of public access uh, to potentially life-changing information. I mean how important is it that our decision makers are relying on evidence rather than pressure from their backbench for example and how important is it that the public have access to information so they're aware of the context in which those policy decisions are being made. Yes, you want, to, you want to start? Certainly. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, for the question. I think for me this comes back to knowing 
that the information can be trusted because it's been backed by evidence-based research. So when we're searching online, we can, of course, find a multitude, an avalanche, in fact, of information. You know, it's easier to find than ever before. But how do we know what we're finding can be trustworthy? There's this real challenge around the veracity of our information and our sources. And for me, this does come back to um, like a basic step, I suppose, in evidence-based research. We can check our sources. So we can go back behind and look and see where those decisions were being made and the sources that were being used. When the research is available openly, we can track back so much more easily than if it has been closed. And that's more important than ever, isn't it, in this era of fake news and people challenging um, Absolutely. You know, facts from every, uh, every dimension. You, you're, do you think that that has um, a bearing on how politicians are navigating the landscape and what's influencing their decision makers? Or are they actually trying to harness it for their own needs and ignoring the evidence? I mean, w what's your take on it? I think it's most probably a bit of both. Mm. So I guess it de depends on how, um, yeah, what the motives are of the specific politician. For, for me, when I, when I think about open access, it's one of those things that um, really doesn't get the, um, the props that it normally deserves. Mm. It's, it's, a really, it's a really important development in order to get knowledge to, um, to your every, everyday person out there. What I would love to see is, is for us to now take more steps to help um, increase the ability for consumers to actually access that knowledge. So when you think about open access, it still often comes in the format of, of scientific papers that, mm. that I like to read and, and we all like to write, but the, the issue with that is, it, that is that it still doesn't come in a format that is very easy to, to first interact with. And, and secondly, even though it is um, um, being vetted, the, um, the vetting process in, in peer review means that there is a bit of a lag so when you, for instance, think of, of COVID, um, when you have data sources out there that are being collected by reputable institutes, often what they still do is they still wait for it to go past peer review. So what I'd love for, for us as a scientific community and as, a, as an information community uh, is to do is to find ways of, of maybe speeding up that peer review process to help um, speed up that access to information um, before we have to wait on, on the relatively arguous peer review process. Mm. And, and do we have a question from our audience here? Um, uh, I think uh, I'll leave this one as anonymous. Um, but it, it actually goes right to the point of that accessibility and what you can trust. And that is, you know, quite simply, can the Be Well plan be used by someone with an existing mental health condition? So this is about the appropriateness of accessing a plan and can we trust this plan if you've already got a, a condition that might be, um, you know, impacting you right now? Is this a tool for recovery or is it purely a preventative tool? Um, Yerp and, and perhaps Mike, um, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. So the, the, um, when, we, when we designed the Be Well plan, we specifically wanted to develop a, a program that could be used by people with an existing condition and without. So um, when you think of psychological uh, therapies and, and skills, they, they often share a, a number of different uh, techniques, but they're, um, when you dissect them, they, they all come down to a couple of common elements. Um, we try to find the common elements that we knew wouldn't interfere with the large majority of therapies out there. So if someone would be um, receiving CBT or, or uh, ACT or any other uh, form of um, generically accepted psychotherapy, generally the techniques that we are promoting in the Be Well plan um, either are similar to what's being offered in that therapy or are um, something that can be seen as a complement. So we specifically looked at, at ways to, to augment what is normally being offered so, uh, so as to kind of reduce the access, um, access issues to psychological treatments in general. So while we do think it can help in reducing um, the stress, which is what uh, Mike sh um, showed in one of, the, uh, one of the slides, we do want to put a bit of a caveat around the fact that even though this is a, it, it is a program that everybody can use, it is not specifically designed to treat mental illness. So if you have severe distress or if you have a diagnosable um, illness where, and, and that's actually the, the symptom or the, the cause that's bringing you to the, to the plan, that's most probably not the best avenue for you to be, to be engaging with um, if you aren't already engaging with traditional services. Mm. Mike, how important is... Can, can I just jump uh, yeah. in there? Yeah. Sorry, um, uh, there was a slide I didn't show, but... Um, you know, you can look at step care or phased care, um, uh, uh, you know, depending on your level of severity 
uh, you, you can kind of phase in uh, the intensity of treatment. And, and I think that there, are, there is a place for Be Well Plan uh, within a, a step care framework. However, we are at the beginning of, of a journey here um, with, with, uh, with respect to evaluation and with respect to um, studies. And I think that there's a lot more research that needs to happen. Um, we need to work out when to use, for instance, um, not just the Be Well Plan, but also low intensity cognitive behaviour therapy versus more intensive uh, cognitive behaviour therapy, as, as an example, or when to start with medication and then perhaps go on to using the psychological therapies uh, for people with pre-existing problems. So there's a whole range of research uh, that needs to occur, and you need to kind of take a wide angle, uh, a, a wide view of the uh, available treatments. And this is what the Orima Institute was set up to do. Um, so as I say, um, it, that's a fantastic question, by the way, I, I, I might add, because um, it really goes to the heart of what is evidence-based, um, when is enough evidence enough, um, and, and how do you promote the science, and how do you promote the, the research um, and the excellence in the research. We've had a question from, uh, from John Khatib um, from the audience. Thank you, John, for engaging. Um, in relation to the statistics in suicide rates, could it be possible that the data that you've um, indicated, Mike, could in itself be, um, from a statistical perspective, an indication or a hint of a future increase? Um, you know, given those slides you were showing uh, that uh, suicide hasn't increased at this point, but is there some sort of foundational concern that th this might be a primer for an increase? What's your thought on that? Look, I'd have um, particular concerns for youth, um, and um, I'd have particular concerns for people who are in financial crisis um, and who will continue to be in financial crisis once some of the... Um, you know, the, the, the economic and, and, and financial supports um, uh, are withdrawn. So I do think that um, we need to start worrying uh, and, and preparing um, and preventing, uh, you know, facilitating preventative programs and outreach programs for um, particular groups within our society. So I would agree that we, we still need to be on red alert. I'll just have a follow-up question here from John as well, and I'll open this up to the panel. Um, he, he asks whether mental health service providers, uh, are they applying the theories of well-being while designing their service models? So does government funding consider well-being while designing mental health projects? So is the money being spent the right way? Is the government taking the right things into account when they're making their decisions? Um, Yerp, Mike, what do you think? This is... Um this is most probably one that gets me going pretty, <laughs> pretty good. Okay, off um, you go. <laughs> no, it's 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 quite it's quite interesting. So um, the science of well-being has been around for decades. Um, so established theories have been around since the since the eighties, and research was done well before that. Um, there's um, appropriate assessment tools out there. There's what well, we saw it in our own review. There's over four hundred studies that have looked at different ways of building well-being. Um, Yet the mental health care sector and um, generally um, organizations that focus on delivering mental health care have kind of not really taken it um, serious in a systematic way. So there will be individual practitioners that will target well-being as a, as a way of trying to enhance their, their treatment focus. But in a systematic way, I think it's one of the, the biggest misses that, that my profession as, as a psychologist and, um, and Mike most probably will echo this, is it's one of the biggest misses that we... We uh, we've had over the over the past decades. It's it's such an easy one to fix. The interventions are there, the theory is there, the assessment tools are there. Um, it's very easy to bring on a on a larger scale in line with existing um, protocols and, and methods. And um, yet we we aren't really taking it up in a in a systematic way. So, um, John, I don't think that um, we are doing that appropriately. Look, my view is that I think the government did the right thing in the first instance. You know, um, people couldn't access their, their doctors, at, you know, because of COVID. And so they, they jumped in with telepsychology services with, um, you know, uh, being able to use the telephone to ring in, to have a session with your, your psychologist or your, your psychiatrist. I think that was the right thing to do in the first instance. They developed helplines. I have an issue with some helplines because by the time somebody rings for help, it's possibly too late. Um, they're already in crisis. Um, 
But you know, you do need helplines. Um, no, no question about that. Um, they then increase the number of sessions that you can, um, uh, uh, you know, whereby you can see a psychologist. It used to be ten; it, it's now twenty. But by increasing the wait list, of course, you've just also increased. Uh, by increasing the number of sessions, you've just increased the wait, increased uh, the wait list. Um, I know from my own personal experience in trying to uh, facilitate um, uh, you know, people that I know um, uh, who needed to see a psychologist that uh, people were told by eight, 10, 20 psychologists in a row, there's a six month waiting list. And that was before the number of sessions were doubled. You double the number of sessions, you then just double or something close to doubling the, the wait list. So we now need a more nuanced approach. Uh, we need another way forward um, to stop that kind of, um, you know, that kind of funnel um, that, that I was talking about before. And I believe that part of taking the burden away from, um, from the mental health system is to, um, um, you know, is to use these preventative and early intervention programs um, to stop people going to the helplines, to stop people needing to see a psychologist face to face and, and to help um, psychologists and psychiatrists actually see people who have really severe and complex needs. Um, uh, so I think that this is what's been missing from, from, from policy at the moment. Um, plus, I think that we also need a, a better outreach services as well, particularly for at-risk populations, whether they're indigenous communities, whether it's um, you know, unemployed youth, whether it's um, people whose um, you know, industries are, are, are at risk. Uh, these are the kinds of um, groups that we need to sit down and have a good hard think about and, and prioritise for these um, kind of wellbeing and prevention programs. We've got quite a, an influx of questions at the moment and um, I'm very inclined to keep the session running a little bit longer and I hope our audience can stick with us for another five to ten minutes while we uh, hopefully get through some more of these questions. Um, we have uh, two questions who, that have just arrived that I'm going to sort of turn into one with a little bit of liberty um, and they both um, are in relation to the Be Well Plan. Um, one asks, how long does it generally take for participants in the Be Well plan to get to session five? So a little bit of a, a question about the, the process of the plan itself, but also whether there's an app for the Be Well plan. So a question about accessibility and usability. Um, so Yerp and, uh, and Mike, perhaps you could take us through that. Yeah, so the, um, the plan by itself is now designed as a five-week uh, plan. And we've done that deliberately. So we we didn't want to give a, a, plan, uh, a program that can just be delivered in one or two days. The, the, the issue with a lot of uh, therapy is, is that um, when you go to a psychologist, they'll give you techniques, but you as a person need to take ownership over your own, over your own treatment and your own betterment. So while the psychologist will, or, or the social worker or the OT, they will give you um, techniques to help you find better ways in your life, you are the person who needs to take ownership over that. So within the Be Well plan, we set it out as, as five weeks, so you actually have time to experiment with techniques that come up in different sessions. And we've now got a supplementary question almost mm -hmm. exactly about that, and that is, um, with the Be Well plan, will we be able to re-enroll and participate several times? So five weeks isn't very long, what if we need more? Can we do it again and again? Yeah, so the, the sessions are, are publicly available online, and um, you can keep going through them at your own pace. Um, we currently recommend that you take um, a week between. Um, we said a week simply because that makes it easy for you to start planning your, your, your monthly schedule. Um, the, the main aim here is, is that you just start experimenting with what works for you. So I think Mike um, indicated this before, there's a, there's a way bigger activity bank than we actually cover within the session. So in the session, you might get to experiment with four or five um, skills or techniques. There's over 30 in there. So we actually advise people to take this on, on their lifelong journey. This, this mental health thing is the same thing as your physical health. If you stop after five weeks, you're not just going to be miraculously living a, a good well-being life for the rest of your life. Mike, did you have some thoughts? No, no, I, I agree with everything that you, you said. Um, I think I, I focused before on this notion of self-agency, um, uh, and I think that that's a really important part of this. Um, uh, and, you know, when you look at the, some of the, the comments that people have made um, after they've been through the program, or if you look at some of the assessments, um, 
this comes through over and over and over again. It's, it's as if people are really happy to be given permission to take control of their own mental health. Um, it, for some people, it's actually even a new concept. Um, there's this kind of perfectionistic expectation that we that these things should come naturally to us. Um, and it's a little bit like physical health. You know, if you want to be physically fit, you've got to exercise. If you want to be mentally healthy, you've got to exercise mentally. Um, and, and you've got to take control of, of that. Um, you can't lose weight or you can't, um, um, you know, maintain a, a healthy body if, if you're not doing the right things by, you know, eating properly or, or exercising properly. And um, B World Plan um, incorporates all, all that same kind of um, framework, really, and, um, and it helps support people's sense of agency, which increases people's self-esteem, which increases their... Um, ability to kind of see things more objectively and to start problem solving um, challenges as they um, emerge in their own lives. We can't sit here and predict what challenges people are going to have um, at any point in their time, we, we, you know, we, we, in, in their lives. We know that there are things that you can expect, but you can always expect the unexpected. And so having that agency, having that self-esteem, having that sense of, um, um, uh, you know, uh, permission, if you like, to be creative, um, and um, and to take control of your own life, uh, we, uh, that that's what builds up optimism and and um, and the good life. Mike, we've actually received a question from Jess, which uh, drills a little bit further into some of those points you were making. And she asks, um, "Do you think that given mental illness, do you think that mental illness and mental well-being are multifaceted and have both a psychological and physiological dimension?" Um, should we be investing in multidisciplinary teams to support uh, the people seeking help from all dimensions? For example, exercise physiologists and dietitians. Um, so that's perhaps analogous to the Be Well Plan. Um, you know, we, we don't necessarily expect people to be able to do all of that themselves, but can we offer them additional support through those other means, the physical means as well as the psychological supports? Absolutely, um, and in fact, that's what uh, when we set up the Oram Institute, it was it was to do exactly that to to work within multidisciplinary teams to find um, you know complex solutions require uh, complex problems require complex solutions, um, and uh, a multidisciplinary uh, disciplinary approach is certainly the way to go. Um, as for the physiological aspects of well-being um, and, and and mental illness. Um, there's been a lot of research in the mental illness space, but actually very little in the in the well-being space in terms of um, physiology or brain sciences, for instance. And so, again, this is something that the Orima Institute was set up to to, to do. Um, at the beginning of COVID, uh, of course, we our approach was very psychological in its orientation. Um, uh, but you know, given that there were so many physical uh, issues related to to COVID, which included things like nutrition, sleep problems. Um, we actually did start to incorporate some of these into the Be Well plan. Um, and, and I think that there's a lot more that can be done. And that's why research is absolutely central to this, because, you know, we want to start adding elements that we think give a uh, bang for your buck, um, uh, that, 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 that are particularly effective. Um, uh, and, um, and we need to, to, to research whether, um, you know, the, the, the extent or the magnitude um, of, of, of the efficacy. There is a follow-up question as to whether the systems as they stand are currently overwhelmed and, and that maybe the practitioners themselves aren't in a position to be able to take on more theories, to be able to take on new things. They're struggling to even do that that they already know. Um, so within the existing healthcare framework, this, uh, uh, this question poses that, you know, what, what is required um, in, from an organisational framework perspective and how much more emphasis can we place on practitioners to try to deliver better outcomes for people? Um, Yerp and, and, and Mike, I mean, are we at a point where they're just so overwhelmed? Yes, it, systems currently are um, are overwhelmed and it's, it comes back to that point that, um, that Mike tried to make um, where we're now giving a double amount of Medicare sessions while we're already facing a heap, um, a heap of, uh, of wait list. Um, so there's, there's inherently an issue with uh, with supply of, of psychologists and mental health uh, practitioners. What, um, what is an interesting challenge, challenge here is, is that uh, we have an opportunity to innovate um, and get people that are maybe not within the realm of clinical psychology or psychiatry um, to actually take on some of those lower level 
um, um, treatment formats, right? So like low intensity CBT, which has been delivered by, by peer-led uh, peer uh, forces, be well planned in a, sim in a similar fashion, digital services, they can actually be, be rolled out without necessarily overburdening the existing system. Um, in addition to that, I'd, I'd love for us to kind of look at, at um, five to 10 to 15 years, and this is where universities can play a very big role. When we start teaching the clinicians of tomorrow, we can actually start embedding a focus on well-being science, um, and not just the psychological domain, the physical and the social domain, to actually incorporate that within the way we teach our, our future psychologists, our psychiatrists, our social workers. Social workers, in, in, in many respects, are often already a, a bit of a step ahead in, in that regard. Um, if we start focusing on, on the future in five years, that's when we'll start seeing, um, seeing a lot of benefit to this. So, um, a place like Flinders University um, is, is perfectly situated to say, actually, what can we do to, um, to fix our curriculum, to, to steer it and align a little bit better of, in, uh, in line with the, the care of the future? Well, much like we've um, uh, jumped on board the entrepreneurship and innovation um, you know, um, train um, and trying to facilitate those kinds of topics and subjects um, in, our, in our programs, um, we plan to do exactly the same with, with the wellbeing um, framework. So we will be running courses. Um, we, we, we will be running, um, and actually we already do have a master's in wellbeing um, uh, within our education um, uh, programs. Uh, we will do so clearly within psychology, that's already there, uh, within social work. Um, but actually we would like to see us roll this out throughout the whole um, university, for instance, so that everyone, Every student that comes to university has the opportunity to, to um, become literate in, in, in well-being and, and to take uh, a lot of the, 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 the skills on board. We're already rolling out Be Well Planned through science and engineering, business, government and law, um, HASS, uh, uh, humanities and social sciences, and, and our college, education, psychology, social work. So already you can see that this movement is actually um, um, growing and growing and growing. We've also incorporated Be Well Plan um, in our university-wide um, student wellbeing um, uh, uh, program. Uh, um, and uh, in fact, uh, just this week, we started rolling it out amongst uh, our staff, um, measuring wellbeing amongst our staff, and then we'll follow that up with, with treatment. Now, you know, universities are like all, like all other organizations. We're diverse, um, we have, you know, multiple needs around mental health and well-being and so i can see that this kind of framework ought be no different for bhp or or, or any other business uh, no matter how big no matter how small and this that brings us to that um, vital point again about access to information and being able to trust that information um you know how um how, how do you see the role of um information holders like libraries, you know, those portals in terms of um, being central to this mission. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, look, I think it's uh, fantastic that this Be Well Plan is available for anyone to access and it's a great opportunity to really build that tool as openly as possible as well as the research behind it being openly as possible. So I think in, in what we see in the library sense is our role in that opportunity to support the research behind the tools, behind the frameworks and help our researchers get their message out both in their tools and in their research so that any member of the public anywhere that you might happen to be can access it at their point of need. Yes, it's a, it's a very good point. Um, we are really getting very close to the end of time here. Um, there's one short question I think we can probably collectively answer very quickly, and that is from Cathy asking, is the Be Well plan suitable for teenagers to use or is it best suited to adults? I, I think the evidence is that it's very much geared to teenagers as, as well as adults. Um, I think um, that would be the case, Mike, and, and you, yes? Teenagers, well, yes? It, it, it's really for adults rather than teenagers right. at this time. However, we are working with some specific high schools at the moment to, um, to develop a, 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 a versions of this for, for high school students, both at junior high school and at the more senior levels of high school. So we'll have that out and uh, ready in, 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 in very soon. But you have to understand we're doing all of this on the, on the smell of an oily rag. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, you know, the, 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 the more funding we have, um, the more support we have from, from the community, then um, the more 
we can do and the faster we can roll out, um, you, you know, using the, the, the standards that we expect of, of um, the wellbeing science and, and, and science more generally. Um, but, um, uh, and, and eventually we'd like to see it in, in, um, in primary schools as well. I think that there are certain ages, you know, year five, year nine, year 11 and 12, you know, where it's actually, I think, um, critical that we start to introduce uh, well-being um, uh, concepts in, into uh, children's and, and, and youth's um, kind of consciousness. So upper teenagers, young adults now, and stand by for, for some um, you know, tailor-made programs for, for younger, younger people, younger users. Um, look, I, I'm going to have to call time because we have run considerably over, um, but everyone has, uh, you know, it's been such a robust and a far-reaching discussion and I'm very grateful. I'm sorry we didn't get to everybody's questions and if yours was one of those we didn't manage to touch on, I, I do apologise. Um, but please do feel free to engage with us via the website and to follow up further um, with the university directly if you have a specific interest. Um, I would like to say thank you to Mike, Yerp and Liz for being our expert panellists this evening and for sharing their time and their knowledge um, with us all. Um, and I would like to once again thank and acknowledge Bank SA for supporting uh, the Brave series. Uh, remember you can watch this session again online and uh, review it via our uh, university webpage and you can also register to receive further notifications. So we've got plenty more wonderful Brave lectures to come. Please do join us again. So thank you once again and good night all. <laughs>